We Christians tend to uh, think of things as in categories like right and wrong, pure or unpure, black and white. For example, uh, we would say that if you're trusting the Lord, you're not going to lie. And if you lie, you're not trusting the Lord, right? Wouldn't we say that? Uh, well, suppose I told you that there was a man of faith who was trusting the Lord, and at the time, apparently, that he was trusting the Lord, he told a whopper. And then, to really make things interesting, suppose that I told you that that was none other than the one man in the Bible of whom it is said that he had a heart for the Lord. Is it possible that somebody has a heart for the Lord and is trusting the Lord in a very difficult situation would turn around and try to lie his way out of it? Well, the man I'm talking about is a fellow named David. And the story I'm referring to is recorded in 1 Samuel chapter 21. So you might want to join me as we sort of walk through that passage. But now let me tell you, we've been going through 1 Samuel and we've come to a place where David is now fleeing from Saul. Saul is the king. Saul has threatened to kill him. Matter of fact, he's attempted to do it several times through other means as well as doing it himself. And David is now a fugitive. We think of David as a shepherd. We think of David as the king, all of which is true. But sandwiched between all of that is David was a fugitive. And apparently that lasted for 10 years. Well, that flight begins in 1 Samuel chapter 21 and extends through the rest of this book. So this is just the beginning of him being a fugitive. The first thing he did is he fled to a place called Nob. Verse 1 says, Now David came to Nob and to Ahimelech the priest. And Ahimelech was afraid when he met David and said to him, why are you alone and no one is with you? Now, a couple of things about this need to be explained. Uh, this little location was just about a mile and a half northeast of Jerusalem. And it was pretty close to Bethlehem, which is David's hometown. And... Uh, we don't, we can't trace every movement of the tabernacle at this period, but apparently the tabernacle was there, and the priest there was possibly the high priest. At any rate, he saw David, and he, the text says, was afraid because David was alone. Now, as we shall see, there were some men with him, but they weren't present with him in this particular situation. But they had fled from Saul with him, and they were a distance away. At any rate, he's standing before the priest alone. And the priest is concerned because, well, David was the captain of the army. He was a military general. He, well, everywhere he went, there was an entourage with him. Why would he be alone? And the implication seems to be that he wasn't sure he trusted David at this point. What's, something's odd. Something's going on. So, dear David fabricates a story. And that's putting it kindly. Look at verse 2. So David said to the priest, The king has ordered me to come to some business and said to me, do not let anyone know anything about the business to which I send you or I have commanded you and I have directed my young men to such and such a place. Now that last phrase indicates there were some men with him and they were a little ways away. But the point is, apparently David was afraid. 
Clearly, verse 1 says the priest was afraid, but David was afraid. Perhaps if that priest knew that he was fleeing from Saul, perhaps he would tell Saul. So David, how do you say this? I said a minute ago he fabricated a story. Can I just tell you real blunt? He lied. There's no way verse 2 can be true. He just flat out lied. He was not on some secret mission from the king who was Saul. He was fleeing from Saul. Some have said this is deception at best and a lie at worst. And that what happened is that David had a lapse of faith. As a matter of fact, one said the fear of Saul temporarily replaced faith in the Lord. Now, some try to wiggle out of this. In fact, I was really intrigued to read that one commentator said, well, he was on a secret mission from the king of kings. Uh, nice try. David lied. So let's just face the text that David lied. The problem is there are indications elsewhere that David was basically a man of faith and he was trusting the Lord during this time. I'll show you that later. I just want you to know that's the conflict in the passage. So, uh, verse 3 says, Now therefore, what have you on hand? Give me five loaves of bread in my hand and whatever can be found. And the priest answered David and said, There is no common bread on hand, but there is holy bread, if the young man have at least kept themselves from women. Now, that's an odd-sounding verse. First of all, I think I understand what common bread is, but it's holy bread. And the answer is this. Uh, as you know, in the Old Testament, there was a tabernacle. Now, a tabernacle uh, is, a, is a big courtyard. And as you walked in that courtyard, the first thing you encountered was an altar where they had sacrifices. Only the people could go that far. Then if you kept going into the courtyard, the next thing you would encounter is a laver where the priest could go and wash, ceremonially wash. Then if you kept going in that courtyard, there was a tent. And that tent is called the tabernacle. So the courtyard is called the tabernacle and the tent is called the tabernacle. It's like New York, New York. That's a city and it's a state. So if you went in that tent, it would be divided into two parts. And in that first part were several pieces of furniture. In the second part was the Ark of the Covenant that contained a couple of items and the very presence of God. So this was uh, designed by the Lord is an object lesson to teach some spiritual truths. And in that first little compartment in the tent was a table, and on it they placed bread that was consecrated to the Lord. That's why it's called holy. Holy means separated. It's consecrated. It's dedicated to the Lord. And every Sabbath, the priest went in and took the bread and replaced it with fresh bread. So then the book of Leviticus says the priest only could eat that bread that was taken from the showbread. So what's going on in this verse is that the priest is saying we don't have any bread that isn't already dedicated to the Lord. It's, uh, we don't have any bread that's common. But, but I have some holy bread, that is bread that has been taken from the table of showbread, that's what it's called, and, uh, but, I, but I can't give that to you to men that are uh, ceremonially unclean. Now there were several things that could make you ceremonially unclean. One would be touching a dead body, and the other was having marital relationships. And so he says, you know, if you've got men with you uh, that are unclean, they can't eat this bread. So David replies to all of that. He says in verse 5, 
He answered the priest, Truly women have been kept from us for three days since I came out. And the vessels, that is the bodies of the young men, are holy. And the bread, in effect, is common, even though it was the consecrated in the vessel this day. So he is answering the priest that these men that are with him are ceremonially unclean, and the bread is no longer on the table of showbread, uh, so they can eat it without violating any kind of law. So, the priest says in verse 6, gave him the holy bread, for there was no bread there but the showbread, which was taken from before the Lord in order to put in hot bread in place on the day when it was taken away. So just simply put, the priest gave him the bread. They were hungry. They were fleeing from Saul. They hadn't anything to eat, so the, Lord, the priest gave it to him. One commentator says at this point, the law which had forbidden the profane use of, the ver- of bread was not intended to prohibit a work of mercy. Now, I find that comment interesting for the simple reason that this came up at, when, in the life of Christ, and he refers to this very passage. What was going on in Matthew chapter 12 is that he and the disciples were walking through a cornfield, and it was on the Sabbath, and the disciples simply took an ear of corn and ate it. And that was against the Pharisaical rules. Now Moses said, don't work on the Sabbath. The Pharisees added a whole bunch of rules to that. As a matter of fact, uh, there are observant Jews till this day that observe some very, very strict rules. Uh, I was uh, going to a gym once. And next door was a synagogue. And I, got, I parked in front of the synagogue. It was in a uh, kind of business area. And they were renting a room there. And I got out of my car to walk over toward the gym. And some, some of the Jews asked me if I would come in and help them. And of course I said, sure. And what they wanted to do was turn on the light switch. That they could not do that. Uh, As a matter of fact, we were working here one Saturday a number of years ago, and a neighbor came over and asked if we would go over to his house and turn on the light switch. I've been to Israel where on the Sabbath, the elevator stops at every floor because you are not allowed to push the button uh, at each floor to what floor you want to go to. So the Pharisees had all these kind of rules. And one of them was you couldn't eat an ear of corn if you were hungry on Saturday if you had to pluck it because that's uh, reaping. That's work. So you can't do that. Well, Jesus said, well, let me tell you a story. David did that. So he points to this very passage and then says, you know, God's really interested in mercy, not just ritual and religion. The Lord is interested in that you learn to love one another and have mercy toward one another. And that is, uh, supersedes any kind of religion you might have. So let me read you again what that commentator said. The law which forbade profane use of the bread was not intended to forbid a work of mercy. Bingo. He's right on. One fella illustrated it like this. He said, we acknowledge the same priority today. Suppose you pass a house that was on fire. You stopped, ran up to the front door, banged on the door, and rang the doorbell. You looked in the window and saw someone lying on the floor. Then you kicked in the door, drugged the unconscious person outside to safety. Even though breaking into someone else's house is a criminal offense, the law will not prosecute you since you saved the person's life. Not a bad illustration of what's going on. So the priest in this case said, all right, uh, don't want you to starve to death. Uh, Jesus said they were hungry. All right, so here, eat the bread. Now, we are told in verse 17, a certain man of the servant of Saul was there that day, detained before the Lord, and his name was Doeg, And 
Edomite, the chief of the herdsmen that belonged to Saul. Now, this sort of interrupts the story. Uh, it doesn't fit the flow of the story, but it is significant because it says this fellow was a servant of Saul. So David had reason for concern if he saw this fellow, thinking that if he goes back and finds out that Saul wants to kill David, he might squeal on him. So that is, I think, the significant. What is interesting, it says, he was detained before the Lord. What does that mean? Well, perhaps he had some uncleanness, and uh, some have suggested that uh, perhaps uh, he even had leprosy or something that uh, prevented him from uh, going back, that he was there for that purpose. Anyway, that's inserted if you keep reading 1 Samuel, that becomes significant later, but at this point, it's just inserted as something you need to know for what comes up. So, verse 8 says that David said to the priest, Is there not here on hand a spear or a sword? For I have brought neither my sword nor my weapons with me, because the king's visit required haste. There he goes again. What is he doing? Lying through his nose. So the priest said, yeah, we got a sword. We got, we got, of all things, Goliath's sword. <laughs> now, what are you doing with Goliath's sword? Well, we don't know. Uh, perhaps it was in the tabernacle as a um, historical monument of some kind. At any rate, uh, he said, take it. And there's no other except this one. And David said, there is none other like it. Give it to me. Oh, this is really a little interesting twist in this story. Here's the man who was going to kill Goliath with a sling. And now he says, I'm going to take Goliath's sword. So he had trusted the Lord to slay the giant, only to lapse into the confidence of the sword of the enemy he slew. Now, that's the end of this little part of the passage. Uh, what's the bottom line? David lied. Any way to get out of that? You agree David lied? Well, let me tell you, that was forbidden in the law. Leviticus 19.11 says... You shall not steal, nor deal falsely, nor lie to one another. So the text clearly says, don't lie. And David lied. Oh, there's more. So we get done with the priest, and he then hightails it to Gath. Now Gath is in Philippian territory, Philistine territory, I should say. So verse 10 says, For David arose and fled that day before Saul and went to Achish, the king of Gath. Wearing Goliath's sword, he goes into Philistine territory. David, you sure you know what you're doing, buddy? Now, uh, here's the odd situation. Uh, he no doubt... I mean, he had all kinds of reasons to be afraid. I mean, the king is after him of all things. But he's going to go to the Philistines? I mean, wouldn't he stick out like a sore thumb? Matter of fact, Chuck Swindoll said, David would have been as conspicuous in Gath as Dolly Parton at a convent. <laughs> I mean, of all things. What are you going to do that for? Besides, I guess the only thing you could possibly say is that it was close to his hometown. Well, it gets interesting. Let me tell you what this little fellow does next. Look at verse 11. And the servant said to him, Is not this David the king of the land? Did they not sing to him to one another and dancing, saying, Saul slayed, has slayed his thousands and David his ten thousands? Now, what's odd about that verse is they had no way of knowing David had been anointed king. Uh, but somehow they listened to what the people had said 
and surmise that uh, he was big stuff. Anyway, <clears throat> they recognized Dolly Parton. That's what they did. And so the text says in verse 13, Now David took these words to heart and was very afraid. Ah. And so he changed his behavior before them and... Oh, this gets real interesting. He pretended he was crazy. He pretended, the text says, madness. Uh, he... Uh, I mean, he, he pertained to madness. The slava was dry, running down his beard. He was scratching at the door of the gate. He was acting like a crazy person. Uh, so uh, there was a little rule in the ancient world that um, the insane were exempt from harm uh, lest the gods be provoked is sort of the idea. So what's going on here is um, he's acting like an insane person because he knows that they thought it was bad luck to kill an insane person. What's he doing? What would you call that? Is that telling the truth? Well, not exactly. It's deception at best. So, they said to him, look, see, this man is insane. Why have, well, the king says, why have you brought him to me? Have I need of a madman that you've brought this fellow to play the madman in my presence? Shall this fellow come to my house? Now, the king just simply says, I don't need a madman around me. I was talking about this passage with a pastor friend of mine. And, uh, and he said... Uh, yeah, he said, I don't need another madman. Now, the text doesn't say that. <laughs> you ever felt that way? I don't need another crazy person around me. I've got enough to satisfy. At any rate, uh, that's what they said. So, that's the story. Now, what do we make of all of this? Very clearly, in this passage, in order to to survive out of fear David lied to a priest and acted like he was insane before a king now could y'all could you put yourself in my shoes for a second how do you preach on that what do you say to people I mean I can just imagine say look at this David 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 of all people David lied now what are you going to do with that I'm going to tell you what I'm going to do with that. You ready? Number one, saints sin. I hate to be the one to break this to you. Saints sin. Saints lie. Saints deceive people. Saints commit adultery. Saints murder. All of which David did. One of my mentors said to me once, Mike, keep in mind, all men have feet of clay. Never forgotten that. That's true. And the quicker you understand that, the better off you're going to be. So you just need to recognize that saints sin. Let me give you a New Testament illustration of that. Uh, of course, there's Peter who lied but let me give you another illustration of just the fact that saints aren't always truthful. Look at Philippians chapter 1. Philippians chapter 1. A very interesting passage. Paul is in prison. He is facing possible execution. And the church at Philippi sent him some financial support. Uh, the prisoners weren't given free meals, so... Uh, they send him financial support. And he's writing them, thanking them for their financial support. Now, listen to what he says in verse 15. Some indeed preach Christ even from envy and strife, 
and some also of goodwill. The former preach Christ from selfish ambition, not sincerely, supposing to add afflictions to my chains, which is a reference to the fact that he's in prison. He says, but the latter out of love, knowing that I am appointed to the defense of the gospel. This is an incredible verse of scripture. He's talking about, I'm in jail, and there are some people that are jealous of my leadership. So, they've taken this as an opportunity to preach the gospel, but they're not doing it with a pure motive. That's what intrigues me about this passage. They are doing it, he says in verse 16, from envy and strife. He says in verse 16, from selfish ambition. Wow, not sincerely. My point is simply this. Saints sin even some who preach the gospel. Is that intriguing or what? So here they are preaching the gospel. And, and apparently they're doing a good job of that. But they're doing it for the wrong motive. Selfish ambition. To further their themselves out of envy and strife. Envy? Strife? Wow. So my point is, saints sin. Got it? I'm not done. Sin has consequences. So it's one thing to say saints sin. But don't use that as an excuse. Because sin has consequences. Do you remember me telling you in 1 Samuel 21 about the priest? He lied to the priest. Well, we're going to see as we keep reading that that priest was killed because of that. Wow. Sin has consequences. I don't care who's doing it. Even when a saint does it, sin has consequences. Now, if you've been listening to me carefully, you're saying, but you know what you said at the beginning of this message is that it's possible to trust the Lord and sin at the same time. Do you remember me saying that? Forget that. <laughs> That's the tough part. So, what, you know, you want to say to David, what were you thinking? It's a very famous line. Um, well, let me tell you what David was thinking. We know from the Psalms that David wrote several Psalms at various points in his life. We know that he wrote two Psalms during this time when this was going on. Would you like to know what David said in a psalm while he's doing all of this? I'm glad you said yes, because I'm going to tell you. I want you to turn to Psalm 56. Psalm 56. We're going to have some real fun now. Um, all right, the superscription, which I've mentioned before, a little word that's before the psalm begins in verse 1, is not inspired, but scholars think that they are accurate, historically accurate. The superscription of this says, when the Philistines captured, captured him in Gath, this is clearly a reference to 1 Samuel 21. Uh, when I went through the Psalms in my personal study, I called this one, When You Fear for Your Life, that it's evident in this Psalm that David was fearing for his life. So someone has said that describes the 
alternate waves of fear and faith that swept over him at the time. Now, what I'm going to do is simply read the passage. All right? What, follow me in your Bible. Psalm 56. The first thing David does is he pleads for deliverance. He says in verse 1, Be merciful to me, O God, for man would swallow me up, fighting all the day. He oppresses me. My enemies would hound me all day. For there are many who fight against me, O Most Holy, or Most High. So he starts out in the first two verses just saying, in essence, deliver me. That's his point. Then he says that he's trusting the Lord. Look at the next verse, verse 3. Whenever I am afraid, I will trust the Lord. Now, this is what I find so fascinating, that... Back in 1 Samuel 21, it says, and he was very afraid, and it's talking about this precise moment, and he says, he's writing a psalm, he's writing a song, and in the song he says, when I am afraid, I will trust you. And that's how I concluded that he was trusting the Lord and lying all at the same time. Put those two passages together, and you got it. Charles Haddon Spurgeon, a great London Baptist preacher of the 19th century, wrote a large volume on the Psalms called The Treasure of David. And in it he said, It is possible then for fear and faith to occupy the mind at the same moment. I'm pausing to let that sink in. Is that true? Can you fear and have faith all at the same time? That's what that verse says. When I am afraid, I will trust. Interesting. Spurgeon goes on to say this. We are strange beings and our experience in the divine life is stranger still. We're often in a twilight where light and darkness are both present. And it's hard to tell which predominates. I thought that was an insightful word. Yeah, I've been in those moments when I was afraid and I was trusting the Lord, but I was still afraid. You can put those two things together. Let me just tell you, folks, I think we give simplistic answers sometimes to complicated situations. Remember this week, uh, my brother, who is a retired therapist, uh, and I were talking about a situation, and I, I said, well, let me give you some possibilities in that situation. I, I rattled off three, and my brother said, are all three? Yeah, that's right. There are multiple explanations sometimes. It's a complicated, we're complicated beings. Now, sometimes it's simple. You get to the bottom line, and it doesn't mean you aren't responsible, but there, it can get complicated. Let's go back to Psalm 56. He says, um, in God, I will praise his word. In God, I have put my trust. I will not fear. What can flesh do to me? Although they twist my words, all their thoughts are against me for evil. They gather together. They hide. They mark my steps. They lie and wait for my life. He's asking the Lord now. He's going to ask the Lord to judge them. I'm in verse 7. Shall they escape by iniquity? Is anger cast down by people? He's confident. You, he says, number my wanderings. Put my tears in your bottle. Are not, are not in your book. When I cry out to you, then my enemies will turn back. This I know because God is for me. In God, I will praise his word. In the Lord, I will praise his word. In the Lord, in God, I put my trust. I will not be afraid. What can man do to me? Then he says, Vows made to me are binding upon me, O God. I will render praise to you, for you have delivered my soul from death. You have kept my feet from falling, that I might walk before God in the light of the living. 
So what Psalm 56 is saying is that when you are afraid for your life, that's the fear, plead for deliverance, trust the Lord and praise him when he delivers you. But this passage indicates that David was afraid, David trusted the Lord, while David was deceiving the king. Now, how do you put all of that together? That's what I'm grappling with. Does it happen? Yes. What do you make of it? All right. Let me pause. Catch you up. Here's what I've done so far. I've demonstrated from 1 Samuel chapter 21, David lied. Any doubt about that? No. I've demonstrated from Psalm 56 that David said he was trusting the Lord. Any doubt about that? Did I put you to sleep? No, I put you to sleep or no you... (laughs) How do you put these things together? Well, David wrote another psalm. Psalm 34. So if you really want to know how to put all this together, you've got to read Psalm 34. The superscription of that psalm says, the psalm when he pretended madness in order to escape from Halimelech, king of Gath. Did you see that? We're told, translated, this is what was going on in his head and pen when he was in 1 Samuel 21. Ah, read this passage. He starts by praising the Lord. I will bless the Lord at all times. His praise shall continually be in my mouth. My soul shall make its boast in the Lord. The humble shall hear of it and be glad. Oh, magnify the Lord with me and let us exalt his name together. I sought the Lord and he heard me and delivered me from my fears. They looked to him and are radiant and their faces were not ashamed. The poor, this poor man cried out and the Lord heard him and saved him out of all of his troubles. The angels of the Lord, the angel of the Lord in, uh, encompassed around me those who fear him and delivered them. Now, David is praising the Lord. He delivered me. What he did next is really interesting. Look at the next verse. He says, O taste that the Lord, uh, O taste and see that the Lord is good. Blessed is the man who trusts in him. O fear the Lord, you his saints. What? He just said he feared the Lord, right? The first Samuel 21 says he feared the Lord, right? Now he's preaching. And he's telling me not to fear the Lord. Well, you did. I'll explain that in a minute. Keep reading. There is no want to those who fear him. The young lions lack and suffer hunger. Those who seek the Lord will not lack for any good thing. Come, children, listen to me. I will teach you the fear of the Lord. He is the man who desires life and loves many days that he may see good. Keep your tongue from evil and your lips from speaking deceit. What? Do you see what's happening? That's exactly what he did. But he really was bent on seeking the Lord and trusting the Lord. And he concluded, you know, I really shouldn't have done that. And and, and now that I did it and I learned the hard way, I'm going to give you some advice. Don't do that. Does that put 1 Samuel 21 in perspective or what? Depart from evil and do good. Seek peace and pursue it. The eyes of the Lord are on the righteous and his ears are open to their cry. The face of the Lord is against those who do evil and cast out the remembrance of them from the earth. He concludes, the righteous cry out and the Lord hears and delivers them out of all of their trouble. The Lord is near and those who have a broken heart and serve such as have a, save such as have a contrite spirit. Many are the afflictions of the righteous, but the Lord delivers him out of their, uh, delivers him out of all of them. 
He guards all of his bones. One of them, not one of them is broken. Evil shall slay the wicked and those who hate righteousness shall be condemned. The Lord redeems the soul of his servants and more of those who trust in him shall uh, be condemned. So, this psalm is saying, uh, the way to be delivered from fear is to trust the Lord and invite others to praise the Lord when you do and fear the Lord. And oh, by the way, don't lie. Now, what I'd like to suggest is simply this. Saints sin. Saints sometimes lie. But if you're really walking with the Lord, you'll recognize that it was a lie. And you'll learn. That's what's going on. So don't use the story of 1 Samuel chapter 21 as an excuse for sinning. Remember, he lied. And that lie had consequences. It was Shakespeare, I think, who said, Oh, what a tangled web we weave when first we practice to deceive. Nothing but trouble down that road. So learn from David. Matter of fact, I went through the book of uh, Proverbs. And one of the lessons in Proverbs is uh, don't learn by making the mistake. Learn from the mistakes of others. That's one of the major points in the book of Proverbs. So David learned it the hard way. Don't learn it the hard way. Learn from David the wise way. One commentator, I think, has really captured what all of this is about. I'm going to read you what I think is the passage uh, paragraph that puts all this together in proper perspective. Here's what this commentator said. David learned some valuable lessons through his ordeal. Before going to the next chapter, read Psalm 34, where it was written about this time. In this psalm, we gain new insight into David's character. He possessed a remarkable resilience which enabled him to grow in his knowledge of God despite his failures. And that, I say, is a good word. Don't go out and make the same mistake. Learn from David's mistake. Be wise. Don't be stupid. How's that for a lesson? Let's pray. Lord, thank you for giving us these stories like the story of David to teach us not to sin, that sin has consequences, that sin is serious stuff. At the same time, Lord, teach us to trust you, even in life-threatening situations. In Jesus' name, amen.